and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and be more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This episode is about the Prayer Book Rebellion of 1549, and it is inspired by a new book that just came out by Mark Stoyle. He's a professor at history at Southampton University, and his new book is called A Murderous Midsummer: The Western Rising of 1549. Before we get started, though, you know what's up. It's time to talk about TudorCon, September 8th through 10th in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Tickets are starting to sell pretty quickly. So if you want to come, reserve your spot so you don't miss out. We do have a limited amount of tickets available. We really try to keep this a small and intimate event where people can really start to have deeper relationships, interact with the speakers, interact with each other. Um, And it's not just this anonymous, huge kind of conference, right? So there are very limited tickets available. So if you want to come, now's the time. Englandcast.com slash TudorCon. I'm super excited. Tracy Borman is going to be speaking this year. She is now part of the TudorCon family. I'm not sure if I mentioned that in the last episode or not, but that's super exciting. And I'm going to be having another Q&A session. It seemed to be pretty helpful for people who came last time when we did it in February. So I'm going to do it again. So if you have questions about TudorCon, stuff that you don't know, if you just want to ask me a random like where to stay or if you think you should come, we're going to do a Q&A on March 24th at noon Eastern, March 24th at noon Eastern time. And you can RSVP for that at englandcast.com slash TudorCon. I have a button right up at the front where you can RSVP for that Zoom and get the download link, etc. So we will look forward to seeing you September 8th through 10th or on March 24th at 12 noon for the Q&A session. It's just super informal. I don't have like a PowerPoint or anything like that. It's just a chance for you to ask questions get to know me, get to know what TudorCon is, get to see some of the other people who are coming, stuff like that. So let's talk about the Prayer Book Rebellion. It's Whit Monday, 1549. And two respected villagers in Devon in Stamford Courtenay, their names are William Underhill and William Seeger, are engaged in a heated argument with their vicar at the parish church. And the cause of this argument was the recently introduced Book of Common Prayer in English, which the vicar had read in church the day before. Underhill and Seeger were upset at this, and they expressed their disapproval at the new book. They urged the vicar to return to the traditional Latin service. After some discussions and back and forth, the vicar agreed, and he said, yeah, you know what, I probably should go back to the Latin service. So this seems like not a big deal at all, right? Just a discussion between two guys and a priest. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? Two guys and a priest are engaged in a discussion about the prayer book. However, this turned into a popular demonstration against the religious policies of Edward VI, which sought to eliminate all traces of the Catholic faith. Within hours, the church had become the epicenter of the protest. Within days, it had spread to the surrounding parishes. Underhill and Seeger became the kind of de facto leaders of this protest. They brought together an army of common people and they laid siege to the regional capital of Exeter in July. Then they sent a list of demands to the government in London, insisting on the cessation of further moves towards Protestantism and the restoration of the Church of England to the state that it had been in during Henry VIII's reign. If you remember, at the end of Henry VIII's reign, the church was pretty much Catholic, except Henry was the head. So they wanted it brought back to that state. The uprising is now known as the Prayer Book Rebellion. It's often called the Great Western Rebellion as well. And we sometimes remember it as this kind of peaceful debate of theology, but it was actually really far from that. The heated emotions of the rebels led to a swift and violent response against the Protestant Reformation. And recent analysis shows that the rebellion wasn't just a minor or a localized disturbance, but it actually came really close to achieving its goals in the West Country, and it threatened even the heart of government. So to give some background, in 1549, the Act of Uniformity was enacted to make the new prayer book compulsory, replacing the Latin liturgy. The protesters argued that the new English liturgy was like a Christmas game, possibly due to the provision of men and women filing into the choir on different sides. Justices arrived at the next services to enforce the change, 
resulting in an altercation that led to the death of a William Hellions, a proponent of the new liturgy. A group of protesters from Stamford Courtney then marched to Exeter to demonstrate against the new prayer book. As they moved through Devon, they gained support and became a significant force. They laid siege to Exeter, they demanded the removal of all the English liturgies, and though some inhabitants of Exeter sent a message of support to the rebels, the city refused to open its gates and it remained under siege for a month. The issue of the Book of Common Prayer was actually the tipping point for the people of Cornwall and Devon. Decades of oppression followed by two years of skyrocketing wheat prices, the rapid enclosure of the common lands, and the attacks on the church led to this furious uprising. In Bodmin in Cornwall, an army rallied under the leadership of Henry Bray, the mayor, and two staunch Catholic landowners, Sir Humphrey Arundel of Helland and John Winslade of Tregeric. Many of the gentry tried to hide in old castles, including St. Michael's Mount, which was besieged by rebels who created a smoke screen by burning hay. The gentry's shortage of food and the distress of women forced them to surrender. Sir Richard Grenville found refuge in the ruins of Tremonton Castle, but was enticed out to talk and was subsequently seized and the castle was ransacked. Sir Richard and his companions were imprisoned in the Launston Jail, and then the Cornish army marched east into Devon to join forces with the rebels in Devon. A Lord Russell was dispatched from London to suppress the uprisings, but he found himself vastly outnumbered by the protesters and was unable to get any local support. He sent out desperate pleas for reinforcements to the government, and only after substantial aid arrived, including hardened mercenaries from Italy, Burgundy, and Albania, was he able to break through the besieging forces and relieve Exeter. However, Russell's troubles were not over yet. The rebels had regrouped in Stamford Courtenay and continued to defy him. He gathered even more reinforcements, and in mid-August, he led an army of 8,000 men out from Exeter to crush the protesters. A brutal, day-long battle ensued, fought amid the fields and hedgerows surrounding the village where the trouble had initially begun. The rebels were ultimately defeated, scores were captured, and subsequently executed. One local priest was even hanged in chains from his own church tower as an example to others. Even normal citizens were not exempt from the violence. One witness wrote that after the rebels' defeat, Russell's troops ravaged the land, as did the foreign horsemen, who did great destruction in the country by taking goods as well as by capturing people and forcing them to pay ransom like soldiers. According to contemporary estimates, The 1549 Western Rising resulted in the deaths of approximately 4,000 rebels. Given the significantly smaller population of the West Country in the 16th century, this was a huge figure. It's fair to suggest that the Western Rising was the most traumatic event in the region's history between the Black Death of the 1340s and then the Civil War in the mid-17th century. Despite being the most determined attempt to reverse the course of the English Reformation, the significance of the insurrection has been largely overlooked by historians. There's a lack of knowledge about the event that's due in part to the fact that much of what we know comes from one single source, the antiquarian John Hooker. He was born in Exeter and he was in his 20s when he helped to defend the city against the insurgents. This firsthand experience inspired him to write a series of detailed accounts of the commotion or rebellion in the counties of Devon and Cornwall, which had been the primary source for subsequent histories of the insurrection. However, it's essential to note that his accounts were written from a particular perspective. He was an ardent Protestant, he was a proud Exonian, and he had no sympathy for the papist protesters, and he wanted to celebrate their defeat and commemorate Exeter's role in it. Additionally, he was confined to the city during the rebellion, so he wouldn't have had much knowledge of any developments anywhere else. So his view of the insurrection is somewhat distorted. In the early 20th century, Francis Rose Troop published the seminal work, The Western Rebellion of 1549, relying heavily on Hooker's accounts. And so our understanding of this event that summer continues to be shaped through this slightly skewed lens. That's where this new book by Mark Stoyle comes in. He uses new evidence and analysis to show that the rebellion was actually much more of a threat to the regime than previously thought. The roots of the Western Rising Rebellion can be traced back to a doctrinal dispute that occurred two years prior. 
In 1547, a traditionalist Exeter Cathedral canon, Richard Crispin, denounced Reformed theology from the pulpit and was subsequently challenged in print by a young Protestant firebrand named Philip Nichols. Crispin found himself imprisoned in the Tower, which was viewed by local religious conservatives as a clear indication of the discomfort they could expect to face under the new zealously Protestant regime. The resentment sparked by this affair may have contributed to the later explosion of violence in 1549. The rebellion had been brewing for some time before the recognized outbreak of violence known as the Western Rising. The imposition of liturgy in English provoked particularly strong opposition in Cornwall, where the resentment was particularly virulent. The previous year, a brief popular uprising known as the Cornish Commotion erupted in the far west of Cornwall, perhaps triggered by the government's imposition of a new order of communion in English. The revolt reflected the determination of local people to protect their traditional religious practices and unique cultural identity. The insurgents even went so far as to kill William Bodie, a royal commissioner who had attempted to enforce the government's religious changes in the district around Helston, and to declare anyone who followed his new fashions would be punished likewise. While Cornwall may not have been the starting point of the disturbances in 1549, the speed with which its people responded to the event demonstrated the strength of their feelings. The protests that eventually developed into the Western Rising began in Stamford Courtenay, like I said, on Whit Monday in June, and then spread to Cornwall in early July. Within three weeks, Humphrey Arundel had his army of 6,000 joining the forces in Devon. From the government's perspective, the movements of the rebels in July 1549 must have appeared far more purposeful and threatening than traditional accounts of the Rising would suggest. It's now clear that the royal forces led by Lord Russell, who were tasked with subduing the rebels, were much weaker than previously thought. Until the end of July, he was dangerously short of men and vulnerable to attack. On or around July 29th, the rebels advanced in force upon Russell's camp at Honiton, and he was forced to sally out to meet them. The resulting battle fought at Fenny Bridges proved to be a critical turning point. Russell managed to defeat the rebel forces that had already assembled at the bridge over the Otter, west of Honiton, and disperse an additional 800 insurgents, described simply as Cornish men, who had hurried up to reinforce them. The late comers were probably the advance guard of the main Cornish host. It had been a really close call, and if Arundel had managed to bring more Cornish men to East Devon a day or two earlier, he may have forced Russell into a headlong fight. And if that had happened, the counties at Russell's back may have joined hands with the insurgents, potentially toppling the regime of the Duke of Somerset, who led Edward's government, and causing the rebellion to spread across the south of England and Wales. Fortunately for Russell, he was reinforced by the mercenary soldiers that he had been pleading for and was able to go on the offensive. The rebels suffered a bloody defeat on August 17th at Stamford Courtenay. However, their goals came close to being achieved during the subsequent factional struggle that raged in the capital. The probable cause of the prayer book rebellion was the religious changes, as we said, introduced by King Edward VI. Lord Protector Somerset implemented a range of legislative measures in the late 1540s aimed at extending the Reformation in England and Wales, particularly in areas of traditional Catholic religious loyalty, such as Cornwall and Devon. These measures banned traditional religious processions and pilgrimage, and commissioners were sent out to remove all symbols of Catholicism, in line with Thomas Cranmer's religious policies favoring Protestantism. This led to the murder of William Bodie, who was tasked with the duty, by William Keitler and Pasco Travian at Helston. The pressure on the lower classes was compounded by the recent poll tax on sheep. This affected the West Country significantly as an area of sheep farming. Rumors that the tax would be extended to other livestock also may have increased the discontent. There was a damaged social structure, which also meant that nearby landowners were not able to deal with the uprising effectively. The Marquess of Exeter, a large landowner in Stamford Courtney, had recently been attainted, and his successor, Lord Russell, was based in London and rarely visited his land, resulting in a lack of local power to stop the revolt. The rebellion may also have been rooted in Cornwall's ancient desire for independence from England, as they were reluctant to accept new laws from a distant central government. The Cornish Rebellion of 1497 and the subsequent destruction of the monasteries under Henry VIII 
had brought an end to the formal scholarship supported by the monastic orders that had sustained the Celtic, Cornish, and Catholic Devonian cultural identities. The dissolution of Glasney College, Crantock College, and Tavistock Abbey played a significant part in fomenting the opposition to future cultural reforms as well. And it's been argued that the Catholic Church had been accommodating of Cornish language and culture, and that the government attacks on the traditional religion had reawakened the spirit of defiance in Cornwall, particularly in the majority Cornish-speaking Far West. But the West Country is not the only region to experience serious outbreaks in 1549. We've also talked about Ket's Rebellion, another significant popular uprising that was happening in East Anglia at the same time as the Western Rising. In fact, several years ago, gosh, eight or nine years ago, I did a whole series on Tudor rebellions. So I will link to that in the show notes. Let's put the show notes this week at englandcast.com slash prayerbook, englandcast.com slash prayerbook. And on those show notes, I will include the link to the rebellions episode I'd done as well, in case you want to dig even deeper into this. There were also a lot of other disturbances in other counties. And as a result, powerful figures began to turn against the Duke of Somerset, believing that his policies had pushed England to the brink of anarchy. In October, an aristocratic coup in London removed Somerset from power, and Thomas Arundel, a wealthy Cornish gentleman and cousin of the rebel leader Humphrey Arundel, played a prominent role in the coup. For several months, it was widely believed that a group of religious conservatives who resisted the Reformation were about to take control. They planned to make Edward's half-sister Mary, a devout Catholic, the young king's governor, halting the move towards Protestantism. This was a moment filled with hope for Humphrey Arundel and the other captured rebel leaders who were imprisoned in the tower. Unfortunately for the rebel leaders, their moment of hope was short-lived. Thomas Arundel and his conservative allies were outmaneuvered by John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, who took power and established a regime that was even more ardently Protestant than the one led by Somerset. In January 1550, Humphrey Arundel and the other rebel leaders imprisoned in the tower were executed by being hanged, drawn, and quartered at Tyburn, ending the tragic story of the Western Rising. However, the rebellion was not forgotten by those who experienced it firsthand. One of the royal commanders, Lord Grey, later remarked that the valor and bravery of these men were such that he had never seen anything like it in all the wars he had fought in. Another loyalist marveled at the courage displayed by the protesters in the face of Lord Russell's mercenaries, recalling how the rebels' archers were so effective with their volleys and arrows against various bands of arquebusers, Italians, and Spaniards that they drove them from their position in banks, ditches, hedges, and other advantageous ground, causing great harm to many of these foreigners. After the rebellion, few participants were willing to openly speak about it due to the fear of punishment. However, there's evidence that the bravery and determination of the rebels were remembered with pride by future generations. In the early 17th century, Thomas Westcote, an antiquarian from Devon, wrote about the Western Rising, stating that if he were to document what the loyals commonly said about the strength, force, and resolution of these commons, especially the archers, readers might doubt whether it had been exaggerated over time. The rebels may have suffered a crushing defeat, but their martial accomplishments remained alive in the memories of their descendants. So that's where we're going to stop it for today. Hop on into the Tudor Learning Circle, tutorlearningcircle.com, to discuss this and all things Tudor. I'll also put a link up in the show notes at englandcast.com slash prayerbook, where you can buy the book, Mark Stoyle's new book, and where you can listen to the other episodes I'd done on Tudor Rebellions. That's englandcast.com slash prayerbook. And remember to learn more about TudorCon, reserve your spot for September 8th through 10th, or RSVP for the March 24th Q&A. Go to englandcast.com slash TudorCon. Thanks for listening, and I will talk with you soon. Blow northern wind, a scent will maybe sweet.